A warm welcome to the On The Tape podcast. I am Guy Atami. I'm always joined by Danny Moses. Danny, how are you? Autumn in the air, Guy. It feels Excuse like me? autumn yes, is you know, in the air. It's funny you say that. Yeah. It is somewhat autumnal out there. I'm glad you autumnal. brought that up. Yes. Anyway. Uh, and Dan, Nathan, Dan, how are you? Fine. Every once in a while, you're excited. <laughs> I can see both of you are excited. Why are you excited, Dan? Because Nathan? we have a great friend of the pod and who joining would that be? us. That would be Peter Bookar of Bleakly Advisors in the house. There's certain people, and I've said this. I don't say it about everybody. Sure. I say it about very few people. When you turn CNBC on, a lot of times you'll have the network on without sound. It's sort of background. Sure. Uh, there's certain people that when they appear on the network, you turn the volume up because you want to hear what he or she has to say. Peter Bookbar is one of those people. I ran into Peter recently in a restaurant in Morristown, New Jersey, Gary Arrows. I don't know if I'm doxing him, but he was out with some kind of, of his friends. Kind of yourself there, too. But he's a fan of the classic rock music. Yeah, he is. And I'm thinking about classic rock. And recently, I saw one of these um, Twitter handles. I think it's like rock and roll. Big following. They put out the 10 greatest guitarists of all time. If you don't have Eddie Van Halen on the list of the 10, it's not a list. And it got me thinking about Van Halen. Now, for me, it's just Van Halen. Anything after sort of 1985 is not Van Halen. But their fourth studio album, as you know, Dan, is called Fair Warning. So I'm here to tell you people now, we're giving you fair warning. Peter (laughs) is here, and we want to dissect a lot of different things. So, Peter, how are you? It's great to be here. It's one of my favorite albums. A hundred percent. I mean, the early Van Halen Diver stuff. Down is a better album, but well, that's, that's fine. fair enough. I think yeah. Diver Down all was the great fifth rock studio album. Yes, album. They were great. I think Dan we just lost. I think we just guy. lost all the no, kids. No, we didn't by lose. Way, I think we didn't lose anything. I mean, yeah. that's how we get into these things. Yeah. We're going to talk a little rock and roll, but first, let's talk about what happened a week and a half, two weeks. It was two weeks ago on that Monday, because obviously I haven't talked to you since the VIX spiked up to sixty or so. It given the entire thing back. The market as if nothing ever happened. So was that a fair warning or is that just an anomaly, Peter Bookvar? All right. The couple of things. August 1st, I thought it was a seminal uh, moment in the market. And I'm going to talk economic data and then we'll talk about mm-hmm. earnings because I think this was also a really big deal, big deal earnings season. So August 1st was a Thursday. It was the day when jobless claims jumped higher than expected and the stock market went down. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is the first time that I remember in a while where the stock market was responding negatively to a bad data point. Then it was followed up by that Friday when we had the disappointing payroll number, market sold off, and that was sort of the, uh, the setup for that, that Monday plunge around the world. So I said, wow, this is maybe a change in complexion. I mean, we already priced in 200 basis points of rate cuts. The Fed is essentially irrelevant from that standpoint. And if now economic data and the earnings trends matter, the Fed does not, where that sort of Fed safety net is no longer there. And that companies and the economy now has to sort of swim on its own in terms of its market impact. Then I thought what was really relevant with earnings was that with the earnings from Google, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, was that this was the first time in this whole AI trade that investors started to say, these are spenders on AI. That means that their expense lines are higher. That means that their earnings growth slows. And not just on a quarter by quarter thing, the depreciation expense that is now built into the earnings for the next many years because they're capitalizing all this AI spend, uh, well, let's rethink this. And that they're spenders of, on AI and they're receivers of that spend. And I think that was sort of a big deal in the market because if we sort of lose the spenders on AI, uh, well, we know that they were carrying a large part of the market load. So you have that and you have this change of complexion in response to the data. And on the flip side, it was the it was the lower than expected claims data a few weeks ago that actually the futures went straight up at 830. And that was one of the catalysts for the rebound in the market that has continued through yesterday. So- I, I'm sensing a change in tone. One of the issues you just skipped over that you talk about all the time is Japan. Yes. Right before all of that happened, stuff was going on in Japan where they raised rates and created a little bit of volatility in their markets, which I think you would agree fed into that. So one area that's kind of come and gone now is, oh, the yen went from 162 to 142 at strength, and now it's weakened kind of back to 146, 147. And the talk of this, quote, carry trade, which leads into the global liquidity trade, 
which helped fuel this. What are your thoughts on Japan here? Because there's no one that's been more informed than you on that. So I'll pull it back even further, going back to last summer. The last time the 10-year yield was around this 375, 385 level, it was July, I think, last year. That was the launching point in the 10-year, that sort of range when the 10-year yield went to 5%, around the time when the BOJ essentially got rid of yield curve control. So the BOJ's influence on the market, their footprint goes back to last year. Now, it's had an impact, and then the market sort of reacted and then has sort of backed off, but then you fast forward to this rate hike. And when you think about what the BOJ has created is emerging market central banks started hiking rates in 2021. The Fed didn't start raising rates until March 2022, and then around that time, the other developed countries. It wasn't until March 2024 that the BOJ finally got out of negative rates and then followed up by the rate cut just recently. So in a sense, you've had two years of being able to borrow cheap money in Japan to use it for any other speculative activity as you choose. But no one really was able to put their arms around the extent at which people were levering up to do this. It wasn't only until the unwind that we sort of got, wow, this was a wake-up call that I thought was a really big deal. So that was on top of what I think was also you know, a fundamental change in the market. Then in early July, also another setup was the sentiment was off the charts bullish. The S&P got 15% above its 200-day moving average. I mean, there were just so many clouds that were coming around all together that you can think of that caused this. Now, what's interesting is this rally because usually it's the self is noteworthy, the rally less so because unless you exceed the prior high, then if this rally fails, then there's some technical issues that the market has. So if today's sell-off, today being that Thursday, is sort of a market reaching some resistance and a change in tone that I just discussed, you know, this is a tougher part of the market here to be buying. All right, let's go back to Japan for a second, Peter, because JP Morgan, I think, had a note out last week saying that they thought 75% of this yen carry trade was unwound. I find that hard to believe because this is something that's been put on over years, if not longer than that. Um, the leverage in the system you talked about, can it happen that fast that the entire thing be unwound? And to your point, I mean, Japan finds themselves in a bit of a pickle here. You know, they're trying to raise rates, they're trying to combat inflation. Obviously, that's going to be problematic for them in terms of what it's doing to their currency and obviously global markets. So sort of thoughts on that in, in the collective. Well, number one, I don't know how they can really quantify this. This, is a, this was a global trade. And there, I know that they look at certain things, certain accounts within the BOJ. Leverage. And yes, there are things you can look at. You can look at, at least in the US, the CFTC data, uh, the, the weekly um, sort of net short mm -hmm. position. So there are ways of looking at that. Uh, but I think it's really tough to really to quantify it. But just because the, that there's been some deleveraging with respect to the, the yen, there's still leverage in other parts of the market. When a VIX is at 12, it's telling everybody, go lever up. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened when the VIX got to 12. Yeah, I want to put two things together that you just talked about. So it's this yen carry trade, you know, looking for higher yielding sort of assets. You could almost say that the MAG-7 was probably a pretty decent beneficiary of that. And then you just said something about this fundamental shift um, that we saw in the market. There aren't too many strategists that I've seen over the last few weeks since the meet of Q2 earnings season who've actually been focused on what you just said. So if you look at the MAG-7, you look at their contribution to S&P 500 earnings and obviously uh, commensurate, you know, uh, um, you know, performance in the S&P 500. And you think about Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla. So four of the seven had their forward numbers kind of ratcheted down a little bit. That's the first time we've seen that in a long time. And then when you think about them being a huge contributor, right, obviously from a CapEx standpoint, keeping a lot of this afloat, I think that's something that a lot of people missed in Q2 uh, earnings season. And then lastly, I'll just get to once we're done with the Jackson Hole stuff, by the time people are listening to this, we're going to know what Jay Powell said. We're going to know basically what the market's reaction was. Um, but then we have NVIDIA next week. And so when we think about Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Meta, they're 40% of NVIDIA's revenue. So if there was any chance that they had kind of soft-ish guidance, like that whole trade could come unwound. I agree because part of it, a big part of it is now vulnerable. And you know, we, we know we know that NVIDIA is going to report at some point that quarter where they say, you know what, the hyperscalers took a little pause on their ordering or that there was some delay in uh, a product shipment or just somebody, customers said, you know what, I have enough chips. 
Uh, we're good for now. Uh, Two things on that really quickly. So I don't know they, when that will they've be. They've already told us that Blackwell, the chip, so this is the next iteration of their uh, uh, hopper or whatever, the H100, um, is going to be delayed by a few months. That could be longer. Who knows? And we've already seen one big customer divert some of these chips. That was Tesla diverting, you know, $500 million with these chips over to XAI because supposedly they couldn't use them. So, like, I just want to set that up. Like, we've seen some indication of that already happening. We just don't have lots of instances yet. I agree. And, and I think also the risk with NVIDIA is that when 40% of your revenue comes from four mm -hmm. customers, you know, that's not a level of diversification that any investor should be comfortable with. They're comfortable now because it, it's good to be on the same side as them. But just as one, uh, one earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg said, this is going to be the year of efficiency. And he, while he's still losing money on the whole metaverse spend, he definitely reined it in. You know, at some point, these, th th these, customers are going to have their their capacity built out for a period of time and they want to grow into that and there's going to be a pause in their spend at some point especially if it starts slowing down their their growth rate in terms of earnings because of their higher expense structure that they're building in building into the P&L. But it's funny Zuckerberg only did that once the stock had been cut in half. When you think about that in 2022 and we just haven't had that pain yet. We have had it in some of the guys who make the servers or some of the, you know, the memory that would be Micron and so there's been some of those AMD who doesn't have a product so they can't step back from it. It really is the hyperscalers and then uh, Nvidia are the ones that are going to indicate that. Yeah, and we're narrowing the scope of that AI trade in terms of beneficiaries. Well, think about this. It's a parlay, right? You have NVIDIA reliant on four customers and the market's reliant on seven companies. Yeah. So it's really the same kind of trade. So one of the things that I think you can help us out here and just to bring this all kind of together with the Fed minutes and Powell speaking tomorrow, UEDA speaking actually tomorrow in front of parliament in Japan, but things finally make sense with the revision that the BLS gave to kind of the job cuts. It lines up more with the unemployment rate. It lines up more with the stuff that you track. And the biggest thing that we see in the market has been what you have talked about, and I cite you all the time with this, is the services business and the goods business. Services, it seems to be the driver of the economy regardless. And so that bifurcation continues here. What does that have left in it? And where are we on that? It kind of put that whole mosaic together. And that leads kind of into what is the Fed obviously going to be doing, in your opinion, in their next few meetings? So Powell, again, with 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 the bond market pricing and 100 basis points of cuts just through the end of the year, and there are only three meetings left, which implies 50 at one of them, and another 100 next year, whether they cut 25 or 50 in September, the Fed is priced in. The Fed is priced in for a lot. It's Essentially, he's irrelevant in terms of its market impact. Your weight is more relevant. Because one of the most noteworthy things that triggered the rally in markets off those lows was the deputy governor of the BOJ who got freaked out by the market response. If Ueda tomorrow or Friday start, says, you know, we still need to hike rates because we're still dealing with notwithstanding the yen rally, it's still too weak and inflation is still too high. Then come Monday, you could have another resumption of, of the sell up because the yen is going to start rallying again. Now, with the economy... I can count on one hand where the strength is coming from. It's the higher income consumer, as we know, specifically their spend on travel, but that's showing some weak knees. If you listen to Airbnb and Marriott and Hilton, uh, concerts and sporting events still being strong. Anything related to AI, because these companies are still spending a lot of money. They're still spending 15 to $20 billion a quarter, You know the, the mag stocks that we know about. Uh, government spending, which... A lot of it flows through into healthcare because the healthcare industry gets multiple trillions of dollars of that spend. And of course, the incentivized parts of the economy, building the factories and facilities, that's doing well. Uh, and that's, that literally is holding the US economy on its shoulders. Because on the flip side, we have the lower to middle income consumer that's essentially in a recession. Manufacturing's in a recession. Uh, Existing home sales is in a recession and anything related to it. I mean, William Sonoma stock is a perfect example of that. Uh, and what Lazy Boy said and what anything related to the home that relies on housing turnover. Now, I should add one other thing to the positive side is the big home builders like Toll Brothers. But on the other hand, within the building business, if you're a small builder, you're losing market share to the big ones and business is not so hot. So there is an incredible... Uh, bifurcation and dispersion within the economy. 
There's a lot to unravel there. So in terms of the home builders, I think Toll Brothers, the average price is just uh, stated on their last earnings reports, about $975,000 per home. So they're going to sort of be, I think, they're going to be protected right now in terms of their customer. But at a certain point, they will fall victim to what I think is a slowing economy as well. But it's going to take a while. What I find interesting, you mentioned like Home Depot and Lowe's. Forget about what their stocks did. The commentary from both those companies were in a word, disappointing, and they spoke to exactly what you're saying. Claudia Sam of the Sam Rule has walked back what she thinks the meaning of this latest unemployment rate ticking up to 4.3% is. And a lot of people said it doesn't mean as much because of the wage gains embedded in it or something to that extent. I am not one of those people, by the way. And I'm one of these people that still think the unemployment rate is going to surprise people. And that'll be the final piece of this slowdown puzzle. Thoughts on that? So let's go through a bunch of data points with the labor market, both anecdotal and hard data. Uh, if you look at or listen to a ZipRecruiter, which to me is not a company-specific thing, it is an industry-specific thing since they are one of the leaders in the online recruiting business where you're looking for a job, you post your resume on ZipRecruiter, and companies are on ZipRecruiter looking for people. So they see every single day the level of both the supply of resumes and the demand for workers. And what they said, they've been saying since for, for basically a year now, they've been talking about a slowdown in the demand for hiring. Mm -hmm. What was noteworthy is the last quarter, they actually talked about an increase in the supply of resumes, more people looking for work, but not necessarily finding it. We've seen a big decline in job openings. We've seen the continuing claims data uh, hovering around the highest level since November 2021. Uh, initial jobless claims are still very low. And this is all happening in sort of a, in a very slow fashion. You know, the, the whole economic um, sort of aircraft carry over the last couple of years, it's moving in a slow fashion, which is sort of fooling people because people are saying, well, if it hasn't happened yet, then it's not going to happen. I mean, you know, in 07, well, if the world hasn't fallen apart yet, it's not going to happen. Um, so claims is slowly ticking up, even though it's still low. So the, the absolute level is sort of fooling people. But if you look at the trajectory, it's moving up. You mentioned the unemployment rate. It's all about the trajectory. You look at the, 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 the pace of hiring, even within the household survey and the establishment survey, it's been slowing down. We're now in the low hundreds. You look at the ADP report, which I think is an effective measure of hiring. It's slowing down. And one last thing on this. So when you look at what's the behavior of an employer, when business slows, they don't just start firing people. They say, okay, there are less people coming into my restaurant. Uh, maybe it's just a cyclical thing. Maybe it's the weather. Maybe it's this. Fast forward three months, business is not picking up. You know what? Let me, um, I'm not going to hire that person. Let me cut some costs here. Three months later, that goes by. Business is not only not getting better, it's slowing down even further. Well, let me get rid of one person. I need to save some money. So it, that's why they consider it a lagging indicator because an employer waits and waits and waits before they respond. So one of the interesting conference calls was Fastenal, who are like, like in the epicenter of the manufacturing industrial world, where now we're two years into this manufacturing recession. And now they are even saying, you know what, we may have to call our employee staff because things are still not getting better. On top of that, and this might be a function of this new economy, people having multiple jobs. But with that said, it's a record number of Americans now that have multiple jobs. Is that, to me, that's not a good thing, but is it just a function of the way the economy has changed? Well, yes, in, in, in a negative way, in the sense that- That's what I think, yeah. too. I mean, when you think about dealing with the 20% cumulative rise in your cost of living, now, granted, wages have gone up by a similar amount so for, for most people, so that's been a, a good offset, but it's still shick, sticker shock in terms of one's cost of living. And- if you're renting, you're certainly inclined to have a second job because the price of rents have gone up 25% over the last couple of years, and that is stretching people. So yes, most people don't work two jobs because, hey, I love to work. It's, it's something that they're forced to do because they need the income. One of the things that's been happening while the market has worked its way back um, has been oil coming in at the same time, which is interesting because the Iran stuff hasn't really gotten worse, at least right now with Israel. So that's kind of geopolitics is kind of, I wouldn't call it stable, but stable on a relative basis. 
but it's also s- signaling a slowdown both in China, potentially in the U.S. I think that under the surface, what's helping the markets is oil coming in because it's a tax on the, on the consumer and it's inflationary when it's high. Is that something you're tracking? And when should we be concerned that oil gets to a certain level that drops off so much it's indicating something much worse than that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question because on the flip side, the supply side has been very disciplined. You know, U.S. oil production's at a high, but rig counts continue to fall and production is sort of flatlined. OPEC is being very disciplined in terms of supply. So if you got a break below $70 with supply being relatively disciplined and inventory still being relatively low, it tells you got an issue with on the demand side. So it's hugely important to watch. I think with the geopolitics, throughout the whole Middle East thing, there has not been one barrel of oil that has been disrupted, as we know. And even with Russia, Ukraine, there has not been one barrel of oil disrupted. Now, I know the Houthis just attacked an oil tanker. Um, so something we have to watch in terms of it's maybe this is the beginning of something that we need to price in. But yes, you get you break below 70. And, and I'm long and bullish energy stock. So I, 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 I don't think it'll happen, but it could. But yeah, there, there's something more alarming if it does. But the demand for oil is, is incredibly inelastic. So you got to have a real shock to the system for it to break below seventy dollars. Any reason we're not filling the SPR? Maybe we are. We just don't know it yet. We've dropped from seven hundred and twenty million total capacity down under four hundred million. Feels like be a good trade for the U.S. government to start buying some oil back here. No so. doubt, but it's definitely an election thing. Just to keep gasoline prices low until sure. November. What they'll do after November, they should start. I mean, it has it has built up a touch twenty five million barrels. It, yeah, it, it's nothing compared to the drawdown, but it's definitely just keeping the price of oil low uh, through early November. So, Peter, if we just think about going back to, let's say, S&P earnings and U.S. multinationals, um, you know, they get, what, 30, 35 percent of their sales from outside uh, the U.S. in total. So we have, you know, oil falling. We have rates that have come in. We have the dollar falling. Aren't there a lot of tailwinds setting up for U.S. corporate earnings, even if we do see a drop off, let's say, in demand by the consumer? How do you, how do you kind of weigh those two things? And again, it may be all the yields are coming down because the economy is weak. The dollar, might, you know, so there's a whole other, there's a whole host of reasons why that might be happening, but might it be the sort of thing that keeps S and P earnings kind of, you know, sticking in there, hanging in there? We're expecting 11 percent growth this year and 14 percent, 14 percent next year. That's per fact set. Uh, seems a little high though. So the earnings growth this year is so good because it's an easy comp, and we were in an earnings recession up until just a couple of quarters ago. But you do make a good point, uh, particularly with the dollar. The, the, the offset that I'm keeping my eye on, one of the things that I've been hearing more of is my cost inputs are still sticking within this the mid-single digit range, particularly on the service side, because the wage side still is a big problem for a lot of service businesses, particularly in anything touching the consumer where you need, uh, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant where you have cos- consumer-facing people that you're paying more. Wages are still going up 4% for those people. Companies, though, are having a more difficult time passing it on to us. So there is potential for margin compression. Uh, even in the ISM today, I'm sorry, not the ISM, the PMI. the PMI. PMI talked about on the input side being stickier, where the output side companies are having still a more difficult time passing it on. So there could be a margin offset. And also, we have to keep our eye on that. I mean, for me, from what I see, it just it feels like a one and a half percent type economy, and if you're a multinational, I don't know where you're going to generate much more revenue growth faster than that. Particularly if you're doing business in Europe, where yeah, Spain's economy is doing well, but Germany is not. Where but in the aggregate, that economy is growing maybe one percent. China is slowing, but India is doing well. I think in the aggregate, where is that revenue growth going to come from? Uh, which is which would be a mitigating factor to that earnings story as well. Okay. You started this by saying fair warning. Is the following a fair <laughs> warning? Okay. Warren Buffett's been paring down his position in Bank of America in a pretty significant way. He still owns quite a bit of it, but clearly he's selling. The same thing can be said for Apple. As of this podcast, Warren Buffett now owns 4% of all the T-bills issued in the United States. I think it's $277 billion, which is more, by the way, than the Fed. Uh, debt to GDP. Debt right now in the United States is over $35 trillion. I think it grows by a trillion every three and a half months or so. So you can do that math. Are these things all in your, and I'm leading the witness clearly, but are these all fair warnings and should we be paying more attention to this stuff? 
if there is a human being on earth that has more access to real-time economic data, it is him with the businesses that he owns. And I don't know whether he gets his spreadsheets every day, every week, but when you think about he's getting, call it every day, every week, rail car loadings and chocolate sales and ice cream sales at Deke. There is no one who has access to that daily information that he does. Car insurance. And car insurance, exactly. And the sale of bricks into residential construction. I mean, he touches everything with what he owns. So you you have to respect the decision making he's doing on the publicly traded side, no doubt about it. Now, I think with Apple, while he sort of drifted from being that deep value cigar butt type investor and sort of developed into just give me good businesses, um, he still pays attention to what a PE ratio is. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing with the markets when money's cheap, we know is that people become valuation agnostic. And I think that with his position in Apple just got so large, the multiple so elevated that it was just a prudent decision. But the Bank America is, I think, more telling in the sense that Bank America is a business that touches everybody every single day whether it's on the business side or the household side. And I think that that is noteworthy too. Peter, so let's go back to the debt for a second. Guy asked when, and I'm going to lead, leading the witness to another asset class, obviously, but we'll be at 37 trillion in debt when the election's over, which is when you can start to look at the debt ceiling again, which will probably be postponed. And it'll be 38 trillion by the time they worry about it. A trillion in interest a year and growing, right? This is not a sustainable thing. And the point you made before about if the economy is indeed slowing and tax receipts slow, that only feeds into that. When is that going to matter? And it's not like the boy crying wolf. It's there. There's no one's crying. But if that starts to matter in the market, is it, it that's it? I mean, what what and what does our favorite asset gold do under these circumstances? Is that part of the reason gold's getting its day here? So on paper, it would seem that where you would get the signals that it matters is obviously on the interest rate side. It's whether it's an auction, whether it's the 10-year yield just staying more elevated, less in demand for the paper. But I'm beginning to think that maybe it reflects itself in the dollar. Maybe it's the first sort of sign of worry about the finances of the US government is reflected in the dollar instead. A weaker dollar. A weaker dollar. Right. And when you look at the trends, now this is all have been this has all been more of a an evolutionary type situation where over the last twenty years, let's go back ten years. Ten years ago, foreigners owned about fifty percent of the U.S. Treasury market. Today, it's about thirty percent. When you look at the trends over the past ten to twenty years in terms of the percentage of dollar reserve assets as a percentage of that that bucket has continued to drop with gold being a beneficiary. Even the euro, the yen has been a beneficiary, but it's been diversification away from the dollar. Whether it's signs where China's buying their soybeans from Brazil and yuan, and they're buying oil from the Saudis and yuan, and those countries are then buying goods from China and yuan. And it's just the, these things that are beginning to build up. And, and the gold thing is, it's, it's countries that are saying, I need to own less dollars. That means there's less money recycling through the U.S. Treasury market. It's not just, okay, foreigners accumulate dollars in any which way, whether it's through trade or whatever, and they recycle it into the U.S. Treasury market. That's ha happening less and less. now. So now I'm wondering whether the dollar weakness is going to be the first signs of tell that it begins to matter. So now we've had, fast forward, we have this dollar weakness. And I know we always like to look at the Dixie just because it's it, it's something that it's it's notable. But the Dixie's still very heavy Euro yen. Now you can throw in the pound and that almost makes up the entire basket. Swissy too. But what's most interesting is that other Asian currencies are now rallying. And you're seeing um, other currencies that you would not really look at as now rallying against the dollar. And is this just, okay, well, the yen's rallying and it's dragging up other Asian currencies? Or is are we sort of passing the Rubicon of now it beginning to matter. Again, it's not showing up necessarily in yields. Yields are now benefiting from the possibility of rate cuts and so on. But to me, this 375 level is so huge in the 10 year in terms of maybe tying into that weakness in the dollar because this was the launching pad in terms of level for the move last summer to 5% in the 10 year when the BOJ got rid of yield curve control. So 
I guess I'm switching it around. I'm watching for the dollar and its further weakness, if it matters, if, if the DXY breaks 100, if the other, uh, other Asian currencies start to rally because Asians own a lot of, I mean, Japan and China, two biggest holders of treasuries. So where their currencies go is going to flow through to the U.S. Treasury market. And, and what that means. So I do think it's beginning to matter. I mean, 40 years ago, I did read about uh, the growing concerns about the U.S. trade, uh, the, I'm sorry, budget deficit in 1985. It's, oh my God, we're exceeding a trillion dollars in national debt. And, and 40 years later, and we're still wondering when it matters. This time around, I think it can first matter in the dollar before it moves into rates. Well, historically, 130% is sort of the threshold for debt to GDP where things actually do matter. And we're right there right now here in the United States. But so I'm one, I've been one of these people, correctly for a while, now clearly incorrectly, that thought yields in the United States would go higher, not because of economic growth, but because of all the things we've been just talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes, uh, supply, demand, debt, potential for not a failed auction, but you know a series of really terrible auctions, all those different things. I think what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, I've been looking in the wrong place, and I should be really focused on the dollar. And you know, if the dollar starts moving lower in a continued fashion, that's really the thing that we should all be watching, not necessarily the bond market. Is that fair? I, I, I agree. Uh, and one, one other thing with, with that's going to flow through this as well, there's still global QT going on. And there's no sign yet that that's stopping anytime soon. I mean, it was the KC president in Jackson Hole. He's been very against having an excessively large balance sheet. He is saying it's got to continue to shrink. The, B, the BOJ is essentially doing now QT because while they're slowing the pace of QE, that's exceeding the pace of what is maturing. So it's technically now QT. So you have the, the, the epicenter of this monetary experiment that is now essentially shifting to QT. The ECB shrinking their balance sheet. The BOE is literally continuing to sell gilts. The Bank of, of Canada has been selling bonds. So while these central banks are cutting interest rates, they are also doing QT. So the dollar and this continued QT, something is going to eventually break. break. So let me ask you a question. I, I, I think we topped out here in the United States, and you know better than I do, but uh, close to a $10 trillion balance sheet. I think it got to about $9.7 or so trillion. You know where it is right now better than I do. There should be a Fed balance sheet based on money supply and a couple different factors. What It shouldn't be where it is now, but it shouldn't be zero. What's the right number in your opinion? Okay. So if you took the $800 billion it stood at before the great financial crisis, $800 billion, that's it. Less than a trillion. Okay. Right. If you matched it up with the growth of nominal GDP, and let's just throw in a, another half a trillion for- Generosity sake, and to have the bank, let's the banks have extra reserves. It would be three. It should be three trillion today. It's a little over seven. Right. So it's still more than double what it should have been if it was just left alone to grow in line with nominal GDP. Since then, obviously Bernanke, you know, created this monster that all this other central banks took the baton along with the BOJ. Um, but that's where it theoretically should be. All right, let's keep it For wonky reference. here. So you just mentioned Casey Fed. So we know this this confab, the symposium is going on in Jackson Hole right now. So I think it's really interesting. The title of the symposium this year, Reassessing the Effectiveness and Transmission of Monetary Policy. Okay, so that sounds like word salad. Um, so talk to us what that means. What are all guys, buddies, all these, uh, you know, like Fed heads and everything? What are they doing out there? What are they kind of reassessing? Okay, because again, we talk about the long and variable lags, you know, I, I think when the Fed signaled they were going to start to raise interest rates, right, to kind of take on inflation, you know, the stock market started selling off pretty hard, right? And that's why we had that bear market in 2022. But since 2023, we just haven't cared, right? And so now they're signaling that they're going to cut and the market's back at all-time highs. So what's the deal? What are they reassessing here? I think the most of the probably the back door, or I should say closed door discussions are, okay, we really screwed up with this inflation spike and how easy we how we overdid it with the easiness both on the rate side and the balance sheet side. Now we feel like we're winning the battle against inflation, not necessarily the war, but the battle. To me, the war is not won until inflation stays down, not just goes down. And I think they're all 
somewhat scared though of let's not lose what we've tried to regain through too much on the rate cutting side. And the fear that, oh, if we overstay our welcome here on the tightness, we're going to have a recession, but we're going to be afraid to cut too much because maybe inflation flares up again. Like, I, I think that they're sitting around saying, oh, um, let's just take this one little incy bincy step at a time. Let's not get too far out there. That's why I'm wondering if with the market pricing and 200 basis points of cuts, does Powell throw a sentence in there or two saying like to the market, don't get too ahead of, ahead of yourself. I don't even know what I'm doing the next meeting, let alone where rates are going to be a year from now. So I think there's probably a lot of discussion on that is we are, we're obviously shifting our attention to late labor market. The ECB obviously did, they cut. The BOE obviously did, they cut. The Bank of Canada, they cut. Um, the Fed's going to cut. They're shifting their attention, but to what extent do they need to? Is this a what I refer to as a tweak cutting cycle or a rate cutting cycle? And right now it is a tweak cutting cycle. Let's move from treasury bonds to corporate bonds. And there's something called fallen angels, which is now grown back to where it was pre-COVID level. Fallen angels, when an investment grade bond gets downgraded to junk status, and that continues to grow. That does not include companies like Boeing, which are on negative watch and charter, right? So we often talk about a stock picker's environment. Feels like we're going to have a bond picker's environment soon. So instead of worrying about the U.S. balance sheet and the term premium on U.S. treasuries, I love focusing on these companies potentially. You've written about this, but I think you'll be writing about it more that have these, you know, seven, eight percent type bonds that are out there. Why anyone would own the equity in a company that's public that has high yield trading and junk status makes no sense to me because you can go clip. If you really like the stock, you know that the bonds are money good. So talk to me a little bit about that because the advent of fixed income ETFs and the passive in that world, which I've always felt was a bad setup to begin with, we've seen fits and starts with it. Where are we in that? And when is that going to rear its head? Because I think that's a major thing coming. So I, I think one mistake people are making is they're saying spreads are tight, everything's fine. And not understanding that if you've got to pay an eight per, if you're if you're a, a big company, even if you're in junk status, you've got to pay eight percent cost on your capital, that is rather high. If you are a small, medium sized company and you're paying nine, ten, twelve percent, I don't care how tight your bond spread is to treasuries, that's a high cost of capital. And what, what the problem is, is now if the growth is going to slow, that cost of capital is going to get tougher and tougher to be able to finance. So when I hear people say, yeah, everything's fine. Spreads are so tight. I'm like, it doesn't matter. If you got to pay 8% for your money, that is, that, that, that's a high cost of capital. And that's going to hurt, if, especially if your revenue side starts to slow down. So can I tie this into that, that Lincoln survey yeah, please. of 55 different companies? Now, 55, that's a lot of companies with most of them small, medium-sized businesses. So you know they even highlighted that there is this underlying default um, thing that is metastasizing because it's getting harder and harder to, 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 to finance your debt. And that 40% of these 5,500 companies didn't have enough cash flow to cover their, their interest expense. Their interest coverage was less than one. So I, I think, again, people are sort of tricking themselves into thinking that credit is fine by looking at spreads rather than understanding sort of the pernicious impact of a high cost of capital. And that's why this economy has been more of it like a death by a thousand cuts response to the very sharp rise in interest rates. Because when the Fed raises rates 550 basis points in 18 months, not everyone gets impacted all at once. Because if your debt is not coming due until you know November 2024, then who cares what the Fed was doing in November 2023? But that doesn't mean that that train is not still heading in your direction. And I even investment grade companies that have debt at 3%, that's coming due the latter part of this year into next year, they'll refinance that into six. Now, six, they'll be able to handle just fine, but six is double three in terms of the cost of that capital. All right. And the Fed cutting 25, 50, 75 is not really going to matter. And people forget that during COVID, the government was buying high yield debt 
hand over. They're buying all the ETFs, which have all this stuff in it. So a lot of these, quote, zombie companies that might have failed were given new life. And now you're seeing the cycle. Everything's kind of coming. Everything we see is pre-COVID level, pre-COVID level, pre-COVID. What people forget, right before COVID, the economy was softening. Like things were slowing down at that point, right? That was So I think we're kind of just normalizing, I, you know, I think to your point. But I think the comment you made earlier about QT and all, let's not kid ourselves, okay? QE will come back at some point. We, they cannot let this system fail. So whether that's going to work or not, or people see through it, and that's why we love gold so much, we've seen the iteration. Two prime ministers now are gone, both in, in over, over in the UK and now in Japan as a result of trying to do anything to do with tightening. What did we do? We get a lifeline to the banks the minute that there's a problem. So I don't want to go on in this, but I'm just saying, let's not kid ourselves. This fake QT thing that's going on to me is temporary because if the shit hits the fan, they're turning right, but turn that plumbing, those faucets right back on again. Well, the saying, what you just said is important, the shit hitting the fan, because the difference this time will be they're not going to do QE because the economy slows. They've all been burned by QE. The the, the, the bank of the, the UK government is losing billions of dollars because the losses on the Bank of England balance sheet flows into the finances of the of the UK government. So they so my point is for QE to get turned on is not because what Bernanke did with QE3 was just okay, let's see if we can generate faster economic growth. QE comes on because there's another a hissy fit like the liability driven investment blow up in the in the in the UK. So QE comes back only if there's a true spiking in in rates where the US 10 year goes from 3 and 3 quarters to 5 and a half in a very short period of time. That's be, that's when QE comes back on, not just to generate economic growth again. So we should be careful if it does come back, which I agree that it will, but it's not going to be for good reason. And I want to tie in one last thing with the dollar and rates and whether the finances of the government matter is if there, there's this assumption the Fed cuts short-term rates, long-term rates are going to fall. Now, it's happened over the last couple of months. Every, we've all priced in the rate cuts and the 10-year yields back to the lower end of this range going back a year ago. But if when they actually start to cut and the 10-year yield actually goes up, to me, and it sort of that also tells me that there's a change in tone. It's still a bond bear market. All we've had was a bond bear rally and yields are going to get back up again. Because if you're long, if you want to be long duration, you don't want to see central banks getting cute with the short end. You want them to be tough against inflation. Even though it's moderating, you want them to be, you know, sort of still boot on the neck of inflation. And if they start taking their their, their foot off because they're worried about growth, you can see short rates go down or stay down and long rates actually go up. Well, if 10-year yields go up the way in that manner and the dollar continues to fall, we have there are bigger problems than what we're talking about. And those roads do lead to gold. There are some interesting single stock ideas that you like, and they take place sort of in, interestingly enough, in sort of the commodity stocks, the ag stocks. So talk about that. So just the way that I invest is through a value lens. So that's the perspective I come at things with. So I, I try to find my ideas looking at the 52-week low list rather than the 52-week high list. And uh, I've been following commodities for a long time. I've been following ag for a long time. And corn and soybean prices are sort of a major influence on the price of fertilizers. Now, fertilizers are used on a lot of different crops. Even rice, it, fertilizers are used on. So it's not just corn, soybean, wheat. There's a variety of other, other ones. But they're still, the price is usually tied to corn and soybean. So you can draw a chart of like mosaic and nutrient. Those are two stocks that I'm about to... Um, recommend is you can draw a chart of those stocks with the price of corn. So it's getting the price of corn right, which would then get your fertilizer trade right. Now, the interesting thing with ag is, you know, like oil is a long cycle game. It takes a long time if you're doing spe specifically offshore drilling, it takes a long time to, to, to find the, 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 the area that you want to drill in, to drill in it, to actually take the oil out. Copper is a long lived asset. It takes a long time to get this stuff out of. The interesting thing about ag is it's go, it's year to year complete, can be completely different. The greatest harvest of all time this year can be the worst harvest of all time next year. There's not any sort of carry forward. And on the other side, the demand side is always pretty linear. It's the world grows in population. The demand for food grows. So the demand side is easy to forecast. It's getting the supply side right that's very difficult. So 
Corn and soybean prices spiked after Russia invaded Ukraine. The fertil- fertilizer prices spiked because everyone was worried about supply to Ukraine. And Nutrien went to over 100. Mosaic went to north of 60. And these stocks have gotten cut in half since. And we were lucky to own them going into that invasion. We sold right afterwards. But a couple months ago, when I saw the CFTC data, had net speculative shorts in corn and soybeans at record highs. I said, I need to start looking at this space again. Everyone's bearish, corn breaking $4, soybeans breaking $10 a bushel, nutrient and mosaic getting cut in half. I need to start looking again. And I think that these stocks are so washed out. Nutrient, you can get a 4.7% dividend yield. Mosaic, it's at 3%. And on depressed earnings, they're, pay- they're trading at five times EBITDA. So we've been buying those two names as what I like is, is great companies. When you invest in commodities, they're, they're cycles. This is the down part of the cycle. I'm not sure when the cycle ticks up. I'm not that smart. But it, you're getting paid to wait. Cheap valuation, high dividend yields, and I really like those two stocks. I'll throw two more in there. Archer Daniels, which had an accounting issue earlier, late last year, earlier this year, the stock fell out of bed. But ADM, to me, has found a level where, just in terms of valuation, I think it's interesting. And the other one is Agco. It used to be AG. Now it's AGCO. And if you take a look at that stock, we're down towards levels we last saw in the summer of 2022. And again, if you're right in this turn, which you typically are, this is one that could get going as well. So I'm with you on this ag trade. You spent a lot of time, as I know, um, looking over transcripts, earnings transcripts and the like. And so I'm just curious, what did you hear in just this last week? Um, Walmart was a great example. Here's a company. And we don't have to get into some of the you know, the reasons why they're doing so well. We've covered that for a while here. But they kept on talking about AI and, and how generative AI is helping them do a whole host of things. What did you take away from Q2 earnings calls, um, you know, companies that are just not in technology, you know what I mean, who, who invest in this? Because we all knew that some of the early beneficiaries were going to be tech companies and how they leverage these large language models and the like. Um, what are you hearing in other industries? And, and is this something that you expect to continue? And this kind of goes back to the, the discussion we had before, is that a lot of these companies are going to access this technology from the hyperscalers also. So it was this something, you know, quarter over quarter, clearly year over year, but are you seeing a sequential increase in the conversation about this in other industries? Well, uh, let's just take on the chip side, you talk about that, you know, AI is the only healthy area of, of that business. I mean, even um, AD analog devices, you know, they talked about still soft auto. They talked about actually production cuts in auto. That's 30% of their revenue. Uh, PCs are very weak. PCs, People are expecting yeah. maybe an uptick as it relates to iPhone upgrades and, and all of these. You know, if you're if you're Samsung and, or Pixel and Google, you're putting AI on device. You're going to need more memory. You're going to need faster chips. And that. we'll see. We'll we'll see when Q3 earnings are, are out there and what the builds look like. Right, which is interesting because they're building for that hoped for cycle. If the flow through doesn't come up to snuff, then you've now everyone's got excess inventory all throughout the channel. You know, the word that, at least on the retail side, or anything consumer facing, is the word value. You know, if I had a dollar for everyone, every company that used the word value in their conference calls, like I was joking in my note, one of my notes that, you know, AI was the sexy thing to say for a while. Now the word value is the sexy thing to say. And we heard it in Target, we heard it in Urban Outfitters, uh, we heard it in TJ Maxx. And we also heard it from a bunch of restaurant companies and, you know, even Walmart. You know, the thing about Walmart is, because they're taking share, are they still the best tell on that incremental dollar spend from the consumer? Now, I, they are to an extent, and even the CFO acknowledged and he said for like the third quarter in a row, the consumer is choiceful. And now I'm hearing other executives using that same word as choiceful, but value, value, value is what I'm hearing. And because that's the only thing that's really selling, you got to convince the consumer to spend that extra dollar because. That's the only dollar that they have. And, you know, people like when we talk about like the restaurant business, and this is, and, and I've, ta- I've mentioned this before that people say, well, Chipotle's killing it. Why are they killing it? And McDonald's and Starbucks and others are just having a tougher time. And from a consumer survey that I heard about was when you go to McDonald's and you have $10 to spend, and that's all you have is $10, you're getting one meal with that $10. If you go to Chipotle, these bowls can be so big that you can actually squeeze two meals out of it. 
You can have dinner and you can have lunch tomorrow with that same $10. And that's what people are thinking about. And one of the most glaring, and this like, I was like shocked by this in terms of a tell on the consumer was Casey's General Store. They own a bunch of convenience stores in the Midwest. It's like 7-Eleven in the Midwest. And they said, our higher income consumer spending as is. Our lower income consumer is still coming to our store, but they're sort of moving around in the store. In other words, they're buying fountain soda instead of pulling a can or a bottle out of the fridge. Now, when you're trying to save 50 cents or a dollar, whatever the, the price difference is, your, your budget is stretched. And I also want to tie this because I know you guys talk about it a lot with the stock market. Because one of the most interesting things is the University of Michigan Confidence, the last two months, captured both the stock market sell off and the stock market rebound. So their July reading actually more captured the, the record highs in early July. And they talked about the dispersion between the upper income consumer that was answering their survey, that owns stocks, they were feeling a lot better than those that do not. Fast forward to their August survey, that more captured the sell-off in the markets, that high income confidence level fell. And interestingly, the lower income confidence actually rose. So basically, these higher income people are answering the confidence surveys dependent on where the S&P 500 is. So in the debate of whether it's going to be, let's just say we go into recession because as night follows day, you eventually have one. But the, the, the determination of the extent of that recession could very well be where the S&P 500 I is. I agree. I've said that. How many times have I said that, Dan? Lots, guy. Anyway, so Danny. Peter, another area that you and I both <laughs> love as we get into football season here are the sports gambling stocks. Genius Sports, you and I have talked about. Flutter, we've, we've kind of talked about. And one of the things that's happening to the U.S. consumer because of sports media rights, which are, I believe are directly tied to gambling because the the attraction of these media companies. So Paramount Plus, which is CBS football, just raised. Peacock, which has been on the NBA, raised and all this stuff. But I know that's a sector that, that you've kind of looked at. By the way, it's a tax on the consumer because you're not shutting it off for a dollar, but it's creeping up. What are your thoughts on that? And then what are your thoughts on sports gambling stocks? Because it feels like they're in a secular growth mode, I think you would. And they use AI was my point. So Well, from a business model perspective, the beauty of it is that yes, people love to gamble and the margin on that dollar bet is rather high. Number two is there is sort of a lock-in effect through having to get a license. You can't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm just gonna start a, a betting website because then if you're not licensed, you'll, go to, you know, you'll get arrested for that. So once you get that license, you are sort of a protected state as a business. And then take it one step further, if you have the best technology, like FanDuel, like DraftKings, you are then even further ahead of your competition. So the only sort of dividing line between growth and no growth is adding more states as they legislatively determine whether they want it or not, and the behavior of the consumer. And gambling is sort of in that sort of bucket of in a recession, people are still going to probably gamble. They're still going to sit on their couch and watch football. You can be in a recession. They're still going to do fantasy football. And they, they're still going to want some action, and they're probably still going to have a drink, and they're still going to do the vices that that people do. And maybe they'll bet a little less, but it's still a vice that people still will do regardless of what the economy does. So that's the beauty of that business right now is when you need a license to operate in a state and you happen to get one, and then you throw in great technology and great management, you know that's a special business model. And the two biggest states, California and Texas, have yet to approve, and that is on the come at some point, to your right. point. So. Exactly. Sure. So, Peter, before we get out of here, I, I read your stuff daily. I quote you all the time, literally weekly on this stuff, because I think the stuff that you're doing, and it's com completely objective. You really are presenting things. I like your little slants, though, kind of like a little bit bearish. But anyway, um, how do people find that? How can they sign up for the book report? And tell us a little bit more about Bleakly Advisors and, and what you're doing over there. So the book report, I shifted to Substack uh, within the last year. So they can uh, just type in my name in Substack and subscribe. Uh, and Bleakly Financial Group is just a wealth management firm uh, managing other people's money. And if anybody wants to learn about it, they can go to Bleakly.com.
You're the absolute best, Peter. We value your intellect, your thoughts, but more importantly, I think all of us value your friendship. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, guys. I feel the same way about all you guys.